This is a Religica production. R-E-L-I-G-I-C-A. So why don't we start? Just say your name, say a word about yourself. My name is Abhijit Singh Sachal, and a word that kind of describes me is outgoing. I like to try to go out into my world, interact with as many people as possible. My name is Sukhmeet Singh Satchel, and something that would describe me is humanitarian. I believe in helping for the greater good of society and not being stuck in a bubble, but expanding it outside of your comfort zone that's so that you can reach the masses. Abe, you're 17. Sukhmeet, you're 24. Mm -hmm. You're both brothers. You're both from the Sikh community. Mm -hmm. The understanding of Sava in terms of service is also integrated like music and sports and humanitarianism, all that we do together. What if for the listener who doesn't know much about Sikhism, what would you say, look, here are the one or two defining values that guide your lives, not mm -hmm. just the religion, but what guide your lives as you think about your own identities? So I think in Sikhism, at least what my parents taught us growing up is that like, we don't really follow like the little nitty gritty details but it's more so the holistic idea of compassion. And that's what Sikhism is really about. It's about being kind to others. It's about being truthful, honest, being out there and helping as many people as we can. Abhi, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, and a big idea is this idea of ikumkar, one creation. We all stem from that one creation. And because we're all you know, from that one creation, there's nothing that really divides us. We are all the same. And regardless of cultural differences, we can always work around those. And it reminds us, like my brother was talking about being a humanitarian earlier, this idea that we do need to uh, break barriers between communities to kind of recognize that we are all one. Is there something also about being a humanitarian and a sense of oneness that's connected, that's never disjointed from our connection to the earth? Would you say that's true yeah. too? Yeah, yeah absolutely. definitely. And you both spent some considerable time in different parts of the world. I'll be with you first. Could you talk about your experience and how that connection is meaningful to you? Yeah, absolutely. And it took me, let's go to you next. So in 2016, I had the chance to travel up to the Canadian Arctic. So I was up there for two weeks on an amazing expedition. I had received a scholarship to go on this expedition. And I was with 120 students from around the world and 80 educators. So they're scientists, historians, uh, people from different walks of life. And I was the youngest on the expedition at uh, 14 years old. So it was just an incredible experience. Uh, and one of the biggest things was I saw climate change firsthand. How was that? What I saw the like impacts. Yeah, I saw the impacts of, you know, glaciers melting in communities. So there's this one moment at the Ilulisa Iceberg in Greenland when all 200 of us went silent for a moment. And we could literally hear the icebergs melting. I mean, it was thousands of drops of ice going into the purest water on Earth. How is that? What is that yeah. experience like and when you can hear cracking around you and you know, you know that human beings are responsible for that sound? Absolutely. And it was a bone chilling experience in that moment. You know, I was inundated with feelings of what can we do? But all of us, you know, putting our heads together, kind of thinking about what really could be done. We talked about different mitigation adaptation strategies. And one of the biggest things that I was able to learn was the indigenous connections with land and how strong that connection is. And because that connection is being changed, it's having adverse impacts on the health of indigenous peoples in the Arctic. So it's this idea that because climate change is a real issue, it's, it's a real thing that's happening today. That kind of deepened my connection with the environment. So Kamid, you've also had similar experience. I mean, both of you have formed your own organization that you're launching into the world as well. I want to ask you about that, but can you say some of your experiences that are also resonant with this very idea of connection? For sure. I've traveled around the world. I volunteered in Africa, in Ghana, and Kenya. And I've also lived in the Arctic for six months. And when I was in the Arctic for six months, I met many indigenous folks, elders, where I learned so much from them about climate change, about the adaptation strategies, uh, about what humans are doing currently to destroy the earth. There's so many things that are going on, and it's something that's not talked about a lot. And that's the reason that me and my brother started creating this organization as well. And because of climate change, there's a lot of rising problems as well. Infrastructure, mental health problems, social conditions, so many different things that are rising from this one cause. So I think we need to look at climate change through a holistic uh, view, not just look at it as something that, yeah, it's impacting Mother Earth, which is, you know, that's where we live. That's our, our only planet. <laughs> but um, humans are very selfish. And so when humans know that it's something that's going to impact them, 
then they're going to do something about it. And that's what Break the Divide, that our organization is trying to connect by personifying the effects of climate change to human experiences so that humans can do something about it. So let's talk about this, a Break the Divide. Yeah. I mean, it, this is so important what you just said. We often think of climate change in the abstract, right? Mm -hmm. It's somewhere yeah. up there, wherever that may be. Yeah. And we can depersonalize ourselves, we can disconnect from it. You don't want that to happen. How do you bring people closer beyond the theoretical to their experience of climate change? What yeah. have you got in mind? So going back to Sukhmeet's point about not wanting to care about climate change, it's difficult to care about climate change when we're using numbers like 1.5 degrees. I mean, it seems like a small number. Yeah. Right? Is yeah. that big? Yeah. And it's this idea that it seems so far away. But our idea was there's Inuit youth that both of us had the chance to become friends with, uh, interact with the peers and mentors for, that have experienced the effects of climate change on their communities for the past maybe 20 or 30 years now. And we wanted to personify the effects of that climate change to people around the world. So the idea was if we get youth in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories where Sukhmeet was living, uh, connected with my school, my high school in uh, Delta, British Columbia, we had this idea that perhaps the kids could learn something from it and maybe they could be friends out of all of that. And what happened was beyond what we could have imagined when we had those initial connections. So we had video calls between the two schools up in the Arctic and in BC. And it was just amazing seeing how not only did youth first become friends, so it was like an electronic pen pal system, but then they were able to delve deep into the issues surrounding climate, mental health, infrastructure, uh, youth violence, things like that going on in their respective communities and brainstorm solutions to those. So it was finding, although we're very different, there were, um, all students were Canadian there. They found that shared connectivity in that and then they were able to build off of that to talk about more. Adding on to what Abhi just said right now, we use like Break the Divide now has chapters all around the world. It started with Inuvik and British Columbia, creating a connection between these schools. But after we saw that these schools are actually fostering a lot of empathy building exercises between youth, uh, it's talking a lot about uh, friendships, it's about bringing students together that would have never had a chance to interact with each other before. Uh, right now we have chapters in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and it's starting in Singapore soon and other places around the world in India. And so all these different places are now going to be connected to the indigenous folks in the north with students in British Columbia, students in South Africa. And I think it's going to create a global village of youth. And we're here today at the Parliament of World Religion again, talking about how youth are making a difference. We see a lot of old folks here. We yeah. don't see a lot of youth. A lot of gray is, hair, right? Yeah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it is up to us now to you know take the charge and create these connections so that we can build a better tomorrow. What's the mission of Break the Divide, if you had to just put it in front of the listener so they remember? So Break the Divide began in 2016 after I returned from the Arctic, and the goal was to break down racial, geographic, and socioeconomic barriers between communities through personal connection. Okay, that's great. And one of the things that strikes me is the three of us are speaking, just talking to both of you. I mean, you've had these experiences, you've met, human beings in their communities, that this isn't an abstraction for you, and you're connecting with other parts of the world and bringing that message of service and resiliency, as I understand it. Yeah. For some people, experiencing that, it can also be somewhat depleting and even depressing seeing what's happening in the environment and also with recent reports about the diminishment of animal life mm -hmm. and plant life in the world. But both of you seem to have a kind of inner hope a reservoir of hope. If I got that right, and if that's so, where's that coming from? And is that a part of your platform too, that hope is essential at this moment? Uh, that's definitely the thing. Uh, we believe in Tradikla, which means to keep going forward, living life to the fullest. And if we lose that hope, that spark within us, I think there's, what is the point of life, you know? What does the world need to know about how that term can help all of us across culture and religion? You have to live life to the fullest. And you can only do that if you look around you. You don't look only in your personal bubble, but you expand outside that bubble and you see that the world is so much greater than what you observe. And when you look at it through that aspect, um, there might be a lot of hatred you see, there might be a lot of violence, there might be a lot of despair, but we have to keep going through that. We have to go forward, uh, surpass all that, in order to make a change and a difference so that our future generations can live a life of hope as well. And I would say it goes beyond hope. 
because hope kind of has this connotation that you know we sit back and hope for the best whereas our platform has really been focused on optimism and action so having that optimistic approach through your action and making sure that what you're doing is essentially the best way that you can help the world around you and the people around you i think you guys are also bringing if i can say a kind of generational capacity that will move comfortably around structures that prohibit something to say absolutely yeah but we can do this effectively we just have to find an alternative path exactly right? and yeah. you're doing that yeah how do people respond to what you're doing it's been great so far social media has helped us a lot mm -hmm. and by posting our message out there a lot of people have been reaching out to us from around the world and that's how our chapter in South Africa started. So it's actually a really interesting story over there. Personally, I was just doing some research on the water crisis that's going on in Cape Town. So I was looking into how the drought's been going on for a couple of years over there. And then coincidentally, I think it was a couple of days after that initial research, I got a message from a student in South Africa. So a, a 15 year old student, and she messaged me saying that she wanted to start a Break the Divide chapter. She said that she found out about her platform online and she was so interested. And you know, just that connection that initially made such a huge difference. What is the divide that needs to be broken? What is the divide? We get that question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I would say the divide is a lack of understanding. It's apathy, this uh, disconnection with different ideas, whether it's a stigma around a certain topic or whether it's a barrier, a physical or geographical barrier between people, or whether it's an abstract barrier. For example, the barrier between us and our understandings of mental health, or us and our understandings of the impacts of climate change today. So there's so many divides in society, whether they're physical uh, or emotional or social barriers, and we truly believe that through conversation and dialogue, you can break all of those divides. Do you feel in a way like the generations before have missed an opportunity? Do you feel like your generation sees something that maybe Generation X or Millennials or other, without casting disparities, just a kind of hunch that they've missed a perspective of the world that you're bringing today? I mean, we weren't from that generation, so it's hard to tell. Uh, I think every generation has had its troubles, has its successes. I think because our generation has had the rise of social media and wealth and technology, I think that's helped a lot in getting the masses out there, the word out there. That's why there's so many movements these days. There's so much, you know, if something happens online, it's spread across like wildfire. In the past, it wasn't like that. There were emails, <laughs> there were um, phone My, calls. MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> emails, the bait of my existence. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so all those things, they did, they did limit the exposure that people had to creating social awareness campaigns to all this. So I don't, I don't blame them. I, I don't think there's a, any point of blaming because that's not gonna change anything. All we can do is look for the future and see what we can do with the generations in our past and how we can work together uh, and try to build this world into a better place. So let me go back to the 15 year old you met in, in Cape Town yeah. who contacted you. For the 15 year olds who are out there in the world today and saying to themselves, I want to become more engaged. Mm -hmm. I believe in the values that you're discussing in depth. What do I need to find in myself in order to start reaching out and making a change? Can you tell them what you found in yourselves so that they could say, yeah, I've got this in me too? Or how would you respond to that 15 year old in general? Well, I'm not too far away from 15. <laughs> I'm 17 right now. But a couple of years ago when Break the Divide was starting in it was just this initial idea. It stemmed from a personal inspiration that I had experienced in the world. And the message that I really have to anyone that is inspired or doesn't have that inspiration yet is to go out into the world, get those real life experiences. Don't let anyone stop you and use your passions to make a difference. Find out what you're passionate about. Like we joke about this a lot, Sikmeet and I, both of our parents are actually in the arts and we're both planning on going into the sciences sure. and Sikmeet already, already yeah. is. I mean, our parents didn't place barriers on uh, what our passions could be. And because of that, you know, I got very involved in hockey, playing the piano, music, and that's also important of parts of who I am as an individual. So I, my, I guess my biggest message would be to anyone out there, just be who you are, do what you love, and know that by doing what you love, you'll be making a difference. Terrific. I guess I could add on to that is, I actually gave a t talk a few days ago in Vancouver about, it was called Spark Within. And it was about 
telling 15 year old, 16 year old students about how you can unleash your inner spark. And I told them about the personal experiences that I've had in my life that helped me reach that spark. One of them was being bullied. I was bullied a lot when I moved to Canada as an immigrant in 2002 for my religion, for my culture, for the way I looked. And I used that as a stemming um, opportunity. I used that as a positive thing to improve my speaking skills, to gain confidence. And when I see other students being bullied now, I tell them to, you know, improve their speaking skills, improve their self-confidence so that they can rise above that. In and your life, Sukmeet, is there something about like, when you encounter bullying, mm -hmm. what I hear you saying as well is, it's not enough to be safe. You have to be brave. You have to go out and ply your trade, be your best in the world yeah. and trust yourself. Yeah, I think that's very important. But I think when you are being bullied, you have to have a very strong faith in yourself. And that comes with the support around you as well. So I think another message would be to surround yourself with people who will bring you up. Surround yourself with positive people, your parents, your friends, your family members, whoever else you can trust. Count on them to help you get through this phase. And when you do get through it, you'll become a lot stronger. But never lose that faith in you that your parents instilled within you. I know my religion has been a huge thing for me, being a Sikh and following those principles in life. And so those principles have guided me through life and how I am today. Maybe one of the things we've done to the planet is we've bullied it. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. If we have, and the shoe's on the other foot and we're the bully, mm -hmm. What is it from your experience that we need to learn about ourselves and that we need to step back from, perhaps even inside ourselves? You mentioned we're selfish. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Maybe that's one. How would you respond to that question? That is a difficult question. Um, I have to think about that a bit. Do you know? <laughs> if I could start on that, I think there's been a big focus on revenue, building as much revenue for corporations, for businesses, that the businesses can sustain themselves. And a lot of the times we see that corporations do give back, they're providing opportunities for others, but we also need to look at the bigger picture. And I think a lot of the times we have failed to look at that bigger picture. So perhaps it's not inherent selfishness, perhaps it's looking out for individuals for looking out for your family. Because on a daily basis, when there's a question between spending an extra $10 to buy a sustainable option or providing food for your family, I mean, it's always what hits you close to home that's, that, that you're going to pursue the most. And we see that because we fail to address some of the systematic barriers in place to, for individuals to make differences in their own lives, that's kind of snowballed. We as human beings tend to be pretty decent at addressing crises on our doorsteps. And uh, we'll work cooperatively and quickly with each other. But we're facing a global crisis that will require a couple centuries at least of sustained effort. Mm -hmm. So when you think of those indigenous communities you know around the Arctic Circle or other places that you've been in the world, what's your confidence that we'll be able to sustain that kind of effort in the longer term? So I would say when we look at climate change, you made a great point. Climate change hits the most vulnerable populations the hardest. Uh, people in poverty, people that don't have the best resources to protect themselves against things like incre um, more severe hurricanes, flooding, things like that. And it's important for governments around the world to address those for the citizens of their own nations, but collaboratively to mitigate the effects of climate change uh, at a larger level. Yeah, I think that does take a lot of collaboration and it's difficult. It's definitely not going to be easy and I don't think anyone really thinks it's going to be an easy path. So I think the key to making sure that we stay committed to this path is ensuring that we, we do maintain this holistic approach. We maintain this, I would say, long-term goal of what needs to be done. So long-term goals while focusing on the current present. 
So I, it, and it's very complicated. Like it's not just going to be simply looking out for the future, but we have to look out for our current situation, look out for maybe the next ten years, and look out for those two hundred years all at the same time. And I think that does require international collaboration. It requires different countries, different cultures working together. So then there's that added factor of working past cultural barriers and、uh, differences in cultural norms and things like that. But I think the most powerful thing is again that connection. Because if we look at the world's most powerful democracies themselves, when change happens, it can happen quite quickly. If we look at a legalization of gay marriage in the United States, although it was a slow process at first with only a couple of states, once it hit this critical point where maybe it was forty to fifty percent of the population、uh, supported it, it immediately、uh, got passed in the rest of the states. And if we look at something like climate change, if we get people more connected to nature. And there's more of an incentive from the people for political organizations to do something about it. I think that's very powerful. Is there anything else you want to say that you find inspiring, or a story that you thought, I I love this story. It shapes who I am. I think it's good to get it out there. Today's generation, we were talking about how we don't really look at religion or anything first. We just get to know the person. I think that's very important because you can be Muslim, you can be Sikh, you can be Jewish, you know, you can be Christian. Hindu, whatever religion you are, but it it all makes us the same. We all believe in one thing. It's a higher being, or you don't have to believe in higher. You can believe in whatever you want, or not believe in anything.、It、doesn't make you more right or wrong. I think right now is a time where there's a lot of problems happening with religion as well, where people are using extremist messages to get their voices across, especially in places like India right now, where、um, there's a lot of Hindu nationalist. Um, who are trying to、uh, um, get rid of Muslims or Sikh? Our generation doesn't look at it that way. We look at the past as a way to learn for the future, and the partition that happened in 1947 between Pakistan and India. There's still a lot of hatred towards that, and I mean, there should be. You should always remember what happened in the past. We need to learn from those lessons and see how we can apply it to our future, so that we don't live in a world where children are raised to hate other religions, but instead love each other,、uh, accept each other. I've had a best Muslim friend, you know, my whole life, and my grandfather was in the partition, where a lot of his siblings were killed by Muslims. And so you see that different generations is that, or at least what our grandfather told us is that it wasn't the Muslims that killed, or it wasn't the Sikhs that killed. But it was the government, and it was the society, at the thoughts that they had at that time, you know. And we have to look past all these differences and come together. And that's the main message. And I think building off of that, this isn't a one-sided thing. We can't put a political filter or any other filter on it and say it's okay if we hate these people, but not that. I think that message of acceptance has to go beyond political boundaries, beyond national boundaries. It needs to apply to everyone. This podcast was made possible by Religica Allies.